invite you to take out your Bibles for this morning's scripture lesson. This morning's lesson comes from Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. And if you are using a pew Bible, you can find that on page 14 of the New Testament. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels." Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. All of you extra people who came up. Awesome. Thank you. Choir. You know, we are doing our best this month to provide you with a camp meeting experience. Towards that end, we've got it really hot in here. So it's just like sitting under the brush arbor on a hot summer evening. And, and also, to make it feel like camp meeting instead of sawdust, we have paint dust. And then, and then here's the really camp meeting thing. We're going to have a really long sermon now. Because two hours, <laughs> I won't go that long. I won't go that long. Um, let's bow our heads. God, in the parable that we just heard, Jesus concludes by saying, whoever has ears to hear, let them listen. Well, God, I ask right now that you would give all of us ears to hear what you're saying. And I ask this in Jesus' name and let all who agree say, amen. Well, my friends, it looks like the weeds are taking over the world. Have you looked around lately? Our society is becoming more and more secular. Fewer and fewer people are going to church. More and more people are claiming to be atheist. Scandals, greed, corruption are everywhere in politics, education, business, college athletics, And yes, I know I'm talking about my dear UNC Chapel Hill Athletics, who apparently sent athletes to take fake classes for 20 years. I I know, I know, we did that. I don't want to hear any more about it. Scandal. Scandal. In all kinds of areas, although I do want to say, I hope the NCAA passes down some harsh penalties to Carolina, because as a Carolina graduate, I mean, I want my degree to actually be worth something. Anyway, back to this. (laughs) Scandal, scandal, greed, corruption, more and more. We have public figures being caught having affairs, being caught embezzling, or being caught 
abusing children. As much as I hate to say it, that even includes Christian ministers. You watch television. Every show is rife with sexual immorality. You turn on the radio. The music is violent and vulgar. You go to the grocery store. The covers on the magazines are just one step removed from pornography. If I had kids with me, I wouldn't want to hide their eyes from the cover of mainstream magazines. It seems like the weeds are taking over. We have horrible atrocities being committed by ISIS in the Middle East. Here at home, we have innocent people being gunned down by crazy men in schools, post offices, workplaces, movie theaters, and now, most recently, in Charleston, South Carolina, a church. My friends, it seems like the weeds are taking over the world. Instead of a field of dreams, this world is a field of weeds. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do about all these weeds? Well, this summer we're looking at the parables of Jesus, and it just so happens that in today's parable, Jesus tells us what to do about the weeds. Now, let me tell you one thing about parables, and this, this will help you interpret parables. Most of the parables have some kind of surprise. Most of the parables have some twist that's unexpected, that goes against the way most people would normally think. For example, a couple of weeks ago I talked about the story that Jesus told about a young man who took his father's money and then ran away from home squandered his father's money doing bad things and then comes back home with his tail between his legs saying, Dad, could I just work on the farm? And surprise, Dad welcomes him home with open arms and restores him to a place of authority. And then there's the story about the landowner, which Rick Carter is going to talk to you about next week. This landowner this landowner hired different people to work in his vineyard. Now, some started working early in the morning, first light, and they worked all day. And some started at lunchtime. And some of the workers started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And some dragged in just in time to work one measly hour. And they get to the end of the day, and the whistle blows, and the landowner gathers them all up to pay them. And surprise, the landowner pays them all the exact same thing. There's the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the hero is a guy that everybody hated and nobody trusted. That's the surprise. There's the parable of the lost sheep, where, where, where the shepherd leaves 99 sheep unprotected in the wilderness and goes off to find one sheep. That's a surprise. See, most parables have some kind of surprise, some kind of twist, and the lesson is in the surprise. Now, let's look at the parable we're talking about today. It starts with a farmer who plants seeds, a farmer planting seeds. Is that a surprise? Of course not. Then you have an enemy who sneaks in and plants weeds. Is that a surprise? Well, actually, no. In the time of Christ, people actually did this. It was an early form of bioterrorism. We know this because there are laws against it. There wouldn't be laws against it if somebody wasn't doing it. And, and, and apparently what would happen is if somebody wanted to uh, hurt an enemy, they would sneak in and plant weeds in their field in hopes of destroying their crops. So, so an enemy sneaks in and plants weeds. Is that a surprise? No. So the servants find the weeds, and they look at the weeds and say, we need to pull those up. Those weeds are a bad thing. Those weeds are going to hurt the crop. We need to pull the weeds up. Is that a surprise? Of course not. That's exactly what any of us would do. So they go to the owner and they say, hey, do you want us to pull up the weeds? And the owner says, nah. Let the weeds keep growing. I, I know weeds can be dangerous. Weeds can damage the crop. But don't worry about it. Just let them grow. Let the weeds just grow right alongside the wheat. Is that a surprise? Yes. And herein lies the first message of this parable. Listen 
It's not your job to pull up the weeds. If you're taking notes, write that down. It's not your job to pull up the weeds. It is not your job to pull up the weeds. Jesus says, let the wheat and the weeds grow together. And I want to say, Jesus, have you looked at the world lately? Do you, do you know what's going on down here? And Jesus says, yes, I know what's going on. After all, it is my field. But it's not your job to pull up the weeds. And I want to say, well, Jesus, why not? Jesus says, because if you try to pull up the weeds, you're going to end up damaging the wheat. Now, let's think about some times in history when Christians have tried to pull up the weeds. Back in the Middle Ages... We had the Crusades when Christians in Europe looked at the Holy Land and saw that there were weeds growing there in the form of Muslims who had moved into the Holy Land. And the Christians said, you know what? We need to pull up those weeds. So they decided it would be a good idea to go to the Holy Land and destroy the Muslims who lived there. So they sharpened their swords and they polished their spears and they got on their war horses and Christian ministers told the soldiers that if they died in the Crusades, they would go straight to heaven. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And so the Christian knights rode into the Holy Land like angels of death, and they sliced up the Muslims, and they killed women and children, and the streets of Jerusalem were literally, literally knee-deep in blood. And the evil that was done in the name of Christ continues to damage the church to this very day. In the process of trying to pull up weeds, Christians became the worst weeds of all. And then in colonial America, back in the 1600s, there were the Salem witch hunts. You see, the, the religious leaders in New England, they wanted a Christian society, all wheat, no weeds. They said, we're going to pull up the weeds. And a particular kind of weed that they got real concerned with was women who practiced witchcraft. So they listened to rumors. They acted on hearsay. They dragged women into court, beat confessions out of them. In the end, in Salem alone, they killed around 20 innocent people, including an infant who died in prison. The evil that was done in the name of Christ continues to damage the church to this very day. In the process of trying to pull up weeds, Christians became the worst weeds of all. Now, what about today? We don't have the Crusades and we don't have the Salem witch trials, but we do have an awful lot of judgmental Christians. My goodness. And surveys of people who have walked away from church and from Christian faith have shown over and over that one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons, a big reason, that people walk away from faith is because they feel that Christians are too judgmental. Non-Christians and former Christians find us to be negative, narrow-minded, hypocritical, judgmental, and no fun to be around. We are known more for what we're against than for what we're actually for. I submit to you that this is one more version of Christians trying to pull up the weeds. We're trying to do God's job. We don't want to wait for God to judge the world, so we're going to go ahead and do it for Him. We forget that God is the weed puller, not us. And that's the first message of this parable. It's not your job to pull up the weeds. But wait, 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 there's another surprise. There's another surprise in this parable. Here's the, here's the second surprise. What happens when the farmer stands back and lets the weeds grow? What happens? Is the wheat ruined? No. Do the weeds utterly destroy and wipe out the wheat? No. And you would think they would. Because the weeds that Jesus is talking about are a particularly dangerous type of weed. The Greek word he uses 
Translated into English is a particularly dangerous type of weed called darnel, as in those darn weeds. They laughed at 8.30. Not sure what that says about them and you, but... Listen, darnel is a particularly dangerous type of weed because in the early stages of growth, it looks just like wheat. It's very hard to tell the difference. And if you don't pull it up, it gets mixed in with the wheat, and then you've got real trouble because darnel is poisonous. It will kill you. If you bake it into a loaf of bread and eat that loaf of bread, you're going to get very, very sick and possibly die. Darnel is dangerous. And you know what else? The roots of darnel get all tangled up with the wheat. Now, you would think weeds like this would destroy the wheat, but that's not what happens. That's not what happens in this story. In this story, even though the farmer says, let the weeds grow, there's still a harvest. There's still a good crop. In the end, there's still plenty of wheat to be gathered into the farmer's barn. Even though the weeds grow in the field, in the end, they're still bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. The angels come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. The wheat is not destroyed. And that's the second surprise. Listen, listen. The weeds will not defeat the wheat. If you're taking notes, write that down. The weeds will not defeat the wheat. The weeds will not defeat the wheat. Why did the enemy sow the weeds? Why did the enemy sow weeds in the wheat field? Because he was trying to destroy the whole thing. And Jesus says, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. The enemy's not going to win. It may look like the weeds are taking over, but Jesus says, I promise you, in the end, the weeds will not defeat the wheat. Now, interesting thing. In Matthew 13, Jesus actually tells three parables about seeds. In every one of these parables, three parables, there's a planting followed by a surprise. There's the parable of the sower. It begins Matthew 13. I've talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Farmer goes out to plant seeds. And this farmer is frankly very unsuccessful. He's he's kind of a failure. Three-fourths of his seed falls on bad soil. But surprise! The 25% that falls on good soil still yields a huge crop. And then the second parable in Matthew 13 is the one we're talking about today, where the farmer lets weeds grow among the wheat. And surprise, the wheat still prevails. And then the third parable in Matthew 13 is the parable of the mustard seed, where a farmer takes a tiny, 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 tiny little seed, the smallest of all seeds, and he plants it. And surprise, the seed produces the largest plant of all. Friends, these parables are messages of hope. They're telling us that the seed of God's Word is good. It's still good, and it's still growing, and it's still changing lives, and it's still making a difference. And in the end, the weeds will not defeat the wheat. So, first surprise, farmer lets the weeds grow, and that tells us it's not your job to pull up the weeds. Second surprise, there's still a good wheat crop, and that tells us the weeds will not defeat the wheat. Now, here's the third surprise. The third surprise, listen, is what ends up happening to the weeds. Jesus says the weeds are gathered together and burned. Now, that's a surprise because we don't usually think of Jesus as a hellfire and brimstone preacher. I tell you, I, I, I don't like to preach about hellfire. I mean, and not just because it's not so much that I'm afraid as I, I happen to know that down through the ages, preachers have used the doctrine of final judgment to manipulate people, to scare people into, into doing what the preacher wants them to do, especially giving money to the church. And I also know that a lot of times when preachers talk about hell and final judgment, what a lot of people hear, even if the preacher isn't saying this, what a lot of people hear the preacher saying is, I'm better than you. You're going to hell and I'm not. 
And so I don't like to talk about final judgment, the whole idea of hell. You know, uh, I'll never forget when my daughter was just a little girl. She was like four years old. And um, we were out riding bikes one night. I had, a, I had a little seat on the back of my bike that she could sit on, and, and I would, you know, do the work, and she would just kind of ride along. And we were riding along. It was just a beautiful evening. And I saw some litter on the side of the road, and I said, oh, I hate litter. And my daughter said, I hope the people who threw down that trash go to hell. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 what is this? What? You have a, I, I don't, I'm not a hellfire preacher. Where did you get that from? And she said, from mommy. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, what is my wife saying about me when I'm not at home? And you know, my father is here. My father, Reverend Jack Taylor, he's here. And I grew up under his preaching. He didn't talk about hell all the time, except when I acted up. And then all of a sudden he wanted to talk about it. We don't, we don't like to talk about hell, and we're surprised when Jesus talks about the whole idea of final judgment, because we usually think of Jesus as the good shepherd. We think of Jesus as kind and loving and merciful and forgiving. We think of Jesus holding the children in his arms and, and you know, gentle. Jesus, he touched lepers, he welcomed the unclean, he hung around with tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus, the friend of sinners the lover of our souls. But now, here he is in Matthew 13, talking like an angry street preacher, talking about people being gathered up and thrown into the fire. And to a lot of us, that's a surprise. We never thought Jesus would say this kind of stuff. Well, listen, Jesus is the friend of sinners, and the lover of our souls. And Jesus is kind and loving and merciful and forgiving. And the grace of Jesus Christ is the most amazing thing in the world. But the fact is, Jesus consistently points to a day of reckoning when the world will be judged and evil will be destroyed. And you say, how could a loving God do that? And I would say, how can a loving God not do that? Do you really want a God who never, ever, ever does anything about evil? Who just lets it go on forever? Listen carefully, because I want you to understand this. God does not hate anybody. God does not hate anybody, but God hates evil. God hates the sorrow and the sadness and the suffering and the pain that are caused by evil. God hates evil. Why? Because God loves people, and God hates what evil does to people. But here's the thing. Unfortunately, some people choose to hang on to evil much much to the heartbreak of God, our loving Father, some people choose to hang on to evil. Some people choose to go their own way, to do their own thing. Some people refuse to identify with the farmer whose field this is. Some people refuse to follow the instructions of the farmer whose field this is. Some people refuse to give their lives to the farmer whose field this is. And when God uproots evil... These folks are going to be uprooted with it. Not because God hates them, but because God respects people's choices. Now listen, listen. This whole idea of final judgment, there's, there's lots of debates about what exactly that's going to look like. I mean, you know, some people believe in an occur, eternal conscious torment. You know, hell is a burning fire that burns forever and ever and ever, and there's this devil, and he's got a big pitchfork, and he keeps poking you and making you get in the fire and suffer, and you can never burn up. You can just suffer. Some people believe that's what hell is. That's what final judgment is. So other people believe, no, 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 no. The weeds are just thrown into the fire. They're gone. So you don't suffer. It's just you don't get to live forever. And, and then other people say, no, no, when Jesus talks about final judgment, he means something else. It, it, you know, there's different, different arguments and debates and, and understandings of what final judgment may actually look like. And I'm fine with that. But here's the thing. 
If you read the teachings of Jesus, you cannot get around some element of final judgment. Jesus consistently points to a day of reckoning. That's the bad news. Now here's the good news. Listen, weeds can become wheat. If you're taking notes, write that down. Weeds can become wheat. Weeds can become wheat. That's one reason Jesus doesn't want you to pull them up. Because there's still a chance. Jesus wants every single weed to have every possible chance to turn to Him and ask for forgiveness and be saved. So here's the question. Have you done that? Have you recognized that on some level there's weediness in your life? And have you made a conscious, personal decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, to ask Him to wipe out the weediness? Have you made a personal, conscious decision to commit your life to Christ? Now you might say, Claude, what are you talking about? I'm not a weed. I'm a good person. I grew up in church. I go to church. I go to Sunday school. I help out in the community. I even keep the nursery for crying out loud. Come on. I pay my taxes. I don't cheat on my spouse. We'll go back to something I said earlier and listen to this because this is kind of scary. Remember I told you that the weeds Jesus talked about in this parable, the particular word He used, these are weeds that look like wheat. That means you might look like wheat, but still be a weed. You might be somebody who goes to church and goes to Sunday school and does all kinds of nice things, but inside, you've never given your life to Christ. Inside, you don't have a personal relationship with God. What I hear Jesus saying in this parable, one of the things is that there are those who look like wheat, but in truth are really weeds. But here's the good news. Weeds can become wheat. Right here, right now, you can bow your head and say, God, I don't want to be a weed. I want to belong to you. I want to be a child of your kingdom. Here and now, you can say, I trust Jesus as my Savior and I promise to follow Him as my Lord. You can do that right now. Let's bow our heads. And I want to invite you in your own words. I'm not going to tell you what to say, but in your own words, talk to God. And if you'd like to, ask God to remove the weediness in your life, to forgive you in the name of Christ. Tell God that you trust Jesus to save you. And from this day forward, you will follow him as Lord. I'll give you a chance to do that now. God, thank you so much for this parable and its message of hope that in the end you will prevail. Thank you, God, for this parable and its message of instruction. It's not our job to pull up weeds. Thank you, God, for this parable and its message of warning that we must turn to you God, I thank you that weeds can still become wheat. And I pray that anyone within the sound of my voice right now who's never turned to you would do so. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And let all who agree say, Amen.